So you're coding for loops like they're going out of fashion. You're writing your own functions like some kind of Bill Gates. But every once in a while, you run into a problem and the solutions that you find involve this funny little parentheses operator where they mention the dplyr package and you go running for the hills. Well, my friends, it's time to face those demons head on. Today, I want to introduce you to Modern R and the Tidyverse. By the end of this video, you'll have built a familiarity with the Tidyverse and some of its packages, and you'll have learned what tidy data is and how to manipulate data into a tidy format. The lesson structure then will first introduce you to the Tidyverse. I'll talk a little bit about tibbles and tidy data, and then I'll introduce you to the pipe operator. That's that funny little parentheses guy. And then we'll talk about some common data manipulation vocabulary, filtering, joining, grouping, that sort of thing. The tidyverse, and I love this, an opinionated collection of R packages. So as data scientists, we're all familiar with the fact that we spend probably 80% of our time just cleaning data, getting it into a format that we can work with. So the idea behind the tidyverse and tidy data was to create a data standard that would facilitate exploration and the analysis side of things, where we should really be spending our time. And it came about from some of the early work in Hadley Wickham's reshape package, and he has a great quote here. Tidy data sets are all alike, but every messy data set is messy in its own way. So really, it's a, a philosophy of data. And the philosophy of tidy data can be broken down into three basic points. Each variable will form a column, each observation will form a row, and each type of observational unit will form a table. It's very simple. We put each data set in a tibble, we put each variable in a column, and there we have it. And it doesn't seem like anything new or groundbreaking. And you're probably saying, but Dylan, I already do this. But it's very easy to lose sight of all this. We're going to work through some examples, and I think you'll find that you're guilty of quite a few of these practices. Now, why do we need tidy data? Why do we need to learn this new style of R programming? What was wrong with the old way of doing things? Well, nothing. But there is a general advantage to picking one consistent way of storing data. You'll frequently be using the same tools to accomplish the same tasks, and that familiarity will lead to a lot of efficiency in your work and your programming. There's also a very specific advantage to be had by keeping data in columns. The vectorized nature of R allows us to tap into some of the speed enhancements gained by inputting things as vectors. But this isn't all to say that tidy, non-tidy data is bad. Alternative representations might have substantial performance improvements or space improvements, and specialized fields definitely have their own conventions for storing data that will definitely be different from tidy data. But I promise you, the tidyverse will change your life. So, are you taking the red pill or are you taking the blue pill? Let's see how deep the rabbit hole goes. First step, obviously, is going to be to install the packages in the tidyverse. So go ahead and download those. I've got the code written here for you. And then you're going to attach the tidyverse packages. And you'll see here, once you've attached the family of tidyverse packages. It'll tell you which specific ones it's attached by default and also informs you of any conflicts with functions that you may have already attached to your environment. A good place to start is with the tibble, as this is one of the unifying features of the tidyverse, and they are essentially the modern data frame. They tweak some of the older behaviors of R's native data frame and provide some enhancements that make things easier to work with and certainly prettier. So here I have an example of the familiar iris data set as a tibble, and we are printing it in our console. And instead of getting the entire data frame overflowing our console, we get just the first 10 rows and only the columns that fit the width of our window. So a nice snapshot. We also have some additional information about the size of the tibble, how many rows we are. Um, we are hiding and a little bit of information about the different column types. So I've got doubles, double, double, double factor. Clean and concise, the way we like things, tidy. Now the best way to learn is by doing. So what we're going to do is work through some of the more common examples of messy data. And this is where I think you'll find that where you 
might believe you were following some of these practices, you're probably guilty of at least one of these common problems. So we'll start to learn some of the vocabulary of tidy data by working through examples. The first of which, the case when column headers are actually values and not variable names. You can go ahead and print table 4a here. It is included with the tidy r package. And when you print that, you see it's a very small tibble, three by three, with one column for country, another column for the year 1999, and another column for the year 2000. So these two columns here, the headers are actually values of the variable year. And that makes each row then actually represent two observations. So we have for Afghanistan in row one, an observation from 1999, and an observation from the year 2000. What we need to do then is pivot these columns into rows. And that is exactly what we are going to do using the function pivot longer to lengthen our data. So this function takes as its first argument the tibble, and then as its second argument the columns that we are going to pivot into rows, and then a name for the new column containing that information, and then another column that's going to contain the associated values that used to be stored in those columns. What about the opposite situation? So here we have another table, table 2, also included with the tidy R package. And in this case, we have observations that are spread across rows. So here you can see under the column year, I have two entries for 1999. And the type of data, I have got a, uh, a case, number of cases, and a population count. So here we actually have one observation spread across two rows, and we have that for each year. So in this case, we need to pivot our data wider. And we do that with the pivot wider function, which takes a tibble as its first argument, and then simply the names of the columns we're going to pivot from and the values that we're going to take. And uh, the output that we have here, we can see now we have one single row for each observation and the two variables, cases and population. Nice and tidy now. So let's break away for a moment from cleaning messy data and talk about these tidy tools that we've been using. Pivot Longer and Pivot Wider are two of the most important tools in the tidyverse. There are many, many more, and they include tools for manipulating data, for importing directly into a tidy format. And all of the packages and tools in the tidyverse all share a common philosophy of R and of tidy data, and they're designed to work together naturally. In fact, most tidy functions, as we've seen, take a tibble as their first argument. And this is going to come in handy soon. A lot of the principles of tidy data are closely tied to practices from relational databases, but they're presented in a manner that's accessible to statisticians and data scientists with a standard vocabulary of verbs. Pivot is the first verb that we've learned. Um, pivot wider and pivot longer, they used to be called spread and gather, so do note that sometimes these verbs change. Another tool that we're going to become familiar with is the pipe operator. Now the default behavior of the pipe is to place the left-hand side as the first argument to the function on the right-hand side. And I have an example of this. Um, what it allows us to do is chain functions together so that we can avoid ugly nesting. And here's the example I'm presenting. We have x is nested in the function f with an argument foo, and that's nested in the function g with the argument bar. Now instead of having that unwieldy code, we can chain these together with the pipe operator and send x to the function f, send the output of f to the function g, and we get a nice logical order of, of programming here that's easy to read. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off and get into maybe the more complicated example here as it kind of combines both, exam both previous examples. We have data spread both across columns and across rows. Now this isn't included in any of the R packages, so you won't be able to follow along. But you can see here this Mexican Weather Station data set has columns for each day of the month, and then rows representing the maximum and minimum temperatures recorded at the weather station for those days 
for the year 2010. And all of this is spread both in rows and columns. So we're going to need to pivot wider and pivot longer. And in this example, we're going to do it with the pipe operator. So to read this, we can say that we are piping the weather tibble into the pivot longer function. And we no longer need to specify the tibble in that function because that's what the pipe does for us. And then we pipe the output of pivot longer into mutate. And this is a new verb that we're learning which allows us to create variables or modify existing variables while preserving the rest of the structure of the tibble. So we'll create a new variable that's going to store the, the data for the day um, columns. And then I'm going to additionally create a variable for date so we can condense the year and the month and the day all together. And then another verb that we're learning here, we're going to pipe into the select function which just allows us to pick certain columns that we, we want to retain. We can get rid of some of the, the redundant ones. And now we pivot that, or sorry, we pipe that into the pivot wider function. So first we're going to condense our days and then we're gonna widen our maximum and minimum temperatures. And what we get looks a little bit like this where we have one row for each date and the maximum and minimum temperatures in their own columns. And in, in a manner that is very easy to follow, I think. That's one of the benefits of the tidyverse, really, is that it's legible, it's easy to read. Our next example here is very topical, given the current pandemic. This data set, that WHO data set, comes from the 2014 World Health Organization Global Tuberculosis Report. So it contains the number of cases of TB broken down by country, by year, and the manner in which they were diagnosed and sex and age. So we can see some of those columns. We have country and we have ISO2 and ISO3. Those are all somewhat redundant columns representing where these cases came from. Then we have the year column. And then we have this whole list of columns with these very cryptic headers. And as it turns out, they represent different bits of information. So the new cases represent whether it's a new case or an old case. As it turns out, this data frame only contains the new cases. And then the next couple letters there represent how the case was diagnosed from pulmonary smear positive, pulmonary smear negative. Uh, and then the M or the F is the sex of the case of the patient. And then the numbers represent the age group. So we actually have about four different variables stored in each of these columns that we need to kind of split apart. Um, it's going to involve a sequence of pivoting and splitting and pivoting. Um, and here we have the code necessary to tidy this. So first we're going to pivot longer our columns into rows. And we're just going to call them key. And then we're going to take this key, pipe that into mutate, and overwrite it by replacing pretty much just inserting an underscore here in the word new rel so that it fits with our uh, separate function, separate. And then we pipe into the separate function. So we're going to split, basically, um, split the key into several different words. And then we're going to select, we're going to do an inverse selection here. So we're basically excluding the, fun the, the columns by putting a negative in front of them. And then we're going to separate the sex age column. And when we run all that, you can see the output that we get here is one row for each uh, year, each case, each sex, and each age group. So one observational, one observation for each row, nice and tidy. Now for this next example, we are going to consider the case where we have multiple observational units stored in the same table. So consider this version of the billboard data set. There is a billboard data set in the tidy R package, but this view of it is a little bit different. So this data set contains all of the top 100 billboard hits for the year 2000. So we can see here we've got some Tupac songs and together, who remembers them? Um, we have information about the song and the week and the rank in the top 100 for each of those songs for each of the weeks. So there's, there's actually two types of information here. We have information about the track 
the artist, the song, the duration, the time of the, of the song. And then we have information about its rank in the Billboard Top 100. So to store this in a tidy format, we actually need to split this so that each observational unit has its own table. And we're going to do that in two steps. So we'll first pull out all the song information. And we do that by piping the data set into the mutate function, creating an, a unique ID for each song, each unique song, and we do that with the group indices function, which looks for the unique combinations of artist, time, and track. And then I'm only going to take the distinct records of that, and then we'll select the, the columns relevant to the song, so the ID, the artist, the track, and the time. We'll save that in a variable, in an object called song. And then we'll pipe, or we'll extract all of the rank information. So we pipe the billboard data set, and to mutate, we create the same IDs as we did before, but this time, instead of selecting the distinct records, we're going to keep everything but only the information about the rank. We can have a look at those two tidy data sets. And we have now a nice clean tibble with all the song information, with some 504 boys, hooty woo, and some Aaliyah RIP. And then we have the rank tibble, which has for each of those songs, its corresponding rank. And we can see that the common column that links these two is that ID column. So in the rank, anything with ID 1 is the Tupac song, ID 2 is the Together song, so on and so forth. Now, in actual practice, there are very few tools that can handle this kind of relational data. And so we would probably actually join them back together if we're going to work with this data. But this is the tidy format, and a join is very simple. Um, we're going to do a right join, to be specific, which takes on the left all of the songs, and on the right all of the ranks, and it will keep all of the rows for the ranks and replicate the songs where it needs by a common column here, in this case ID. So we right join song to rank, and this is the output that we get, almost the, the original data set. We are just missing that weak that column for week. And a new verb, join. Okay, and now our last example. We are gonna have the, we're gonna consider the case where we have a single observational unit that's spread across multiple tables or multiple files. These might be spreadsheets or CSV files or tables. So for our example, say you're a scientist, you're investigating the recent prevalence of names that rhyme with Aiden. Ugh. Um, and you've got data that's uh, spread across several data, uh, several CSV files of yearly baby name tables from the Social Security Department in the U.S. Um, this is the, the example that I have. So using the directory function, we can list out all of the files in a specific folder. And I've got them, I've got about six files in this baby names folder. And then we're going to pipe that into the map function or family of functions from the per library. And the map functions will map a vector, map a function to a vector of values. And in this case, the values are file names or file locations. And the function is the read CSV function. So it's similar to apply. We're going to apply that function to each of the entries in this list of files. And I'm using the map DFR function, which outputs a tibble. You get other functions that output lists and, and different types. And so here we can see the output of some of the files that I've loaded. I've got the most common names for, well, the top part of this is for 1995 when I was born. The percent of people registered in the Social Security database with that name and the sex of that particular name. So for 85, you can see the most popular female name was Jessica. We're going to come back to this data set, but you can see how straightforward it is to link or to load um, several files of the same observational unit together in one shot. So this is really a subject for another lecture, but we can also apply the same principles of input tidy, output tidy to both modeling and visualization. We can do that with the ggplot2 function package and the broom package. I'm not going to really get into these. It's a lot to cover. Um, but I will just give you a quick example of some graphics using this sort of 
philosophy of, of tidy data and clean graphics. So I'm taking that baby name data set and I'm just getting it into a format here that um, I want to present nicely uh, in, in visual form. So I'm taking all of the names and piping them into filter and just getting the top 10 and an additional couple extra ones. So I'm, I'm going to filter anything that's in the top 10, any men, any boys named baby and any names that rhyme with Aiden. So I've pulled in another uh, list of names that satisfy that. Aiden, Jaden, Braden, I don't know who are naming their children these, but we are going to filter those, then mutate. I'm going to combine all of the names that rhyme with Aiden and then uh, group them by name, year, and sex, and then summarize them. So I'm going to uh, sum all the percentages here. So summarize, group by and summarize are a new couple verbs that we're learning here, which allow us to do the equivalent of aggregating. And then I'm going to ungroup those, arrange them, sort them by year, by sex, and then reverse percent. And then I do another mutation here where I just add a, a variable, a dummy variable, that will help me order these in my plot. And then I'm going to group them once again so that I can make a faceted plot and then create one more dummy variable so that I can uh, just make it easier for me to organize the plots with ggplot. So I've got that all saved in my names for plot object. And then we're going to use the ggplot function to visualize these. And you can see here the syntax is somewhat similar to what we see with piping. But instead of piping, we're kind of adding different components of the plot. So first I create the plot, then I add a, a, a column geometry, and then I'm going to flip the coordinates, and then I'm going to split these up into different facets by a grouping variable, and then just do some tweaking to the uh, axes. So the output of all of that is this pretty little plot where for 1985 I've got the top 10 most common baby names, including my name and the rhyme, names that rhyme with Aiden for the boys. And then I've got the same for the year 2000. The year 2000! And for 2018. And we can see the rise of those names that rhyme with Aiden. Um, in 85, I was just edging them. And then in the year 2000, they start to creep into the top 10. Now, this is a group of names, so there is going to be that to consider. But by 2018, names that rhyme with Aiden eclipsed every other single name on the list for men. People are crazy. All right, so jokes aside, um, I hope that you guys learned a lot in this video. We set out to familiarize you with the Tidyverse and some of its packages and to build some experience recognizing messy data and tidying messy data into a tidy format. We did this by manipulating it with some fundamental verbs. We learned filter, we learned mutate. Just at the end there, I introduced you to grouping and summarizing and arranging. And we also talked about tools for combining multiple data sets with the join family of functions. So I think we nailed all of those objectives. But if you are interested in learning further, all of this information comes from the classic now tidy data paper by Hadley Wickham in the Journal of Statistical Software and a book that they have, a free book called R for Data Science which contains a lot more examples to work through and a lot more information about this whole philosophy of data. I encourage you to check them out. As always, thank you guys for watching. Be sure to check us out on all of our social media channels at Cape Rad. Please give me a like and a subscribe on this video. And if you are a student studying marine science and looking for more experience about this kind of thing and more practical experience in the field, check out our field course. We do lots of scuba diving, we spend lots of time in the classroom learning how to analyze that data, and it's all great fun. So thank you guys and enjoy. Look forward to seeing you next time.